News Talk 98.9 welcomes you to our new Four County Area local podcast series. And our first contributor is Carolyn. And her podcast is Widow in the Up North Woods, living in the Asable River Valley after losing your spouse. There's an old saying that says, you can't see the forest for the trees. Being a widow's like that, You get lost in the details of it and lose perspective on the bigger issues. And the bigger issue is, how are you going to handle the next 30 years? I'm pretty determined to figure out how to make the next 30 years the best years of my life. Hello, I'm Carolyn, and I'm a widow. It does kind of sound like an Alcoholics Anonymous introduction. That one word says it all. Widow. I was once part of something bigger than myself. I was a significant other, I was a partner, and now I'm not. Maybe we should start a Widows Anonymous group and have meetings. But kidding aside, these podcasts are just meant to be a form of encouragement. They're not a number of steps. They won't tell you how to move through the grief. There won't be lists of things that you must do. These podcasts are just my stories. And through these stories, I hope that you can feel a little less alone, a little stronger, Know that you're enough and that your situation is unique. Most of all, remember that you're allowed to do things your way. Until 2019, we lived downstate. We lived on a lake just outside of Metro Detroit. It was an old cottage that my husband and I rehabbed. I always say we, but he was a retired carpenter. And as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, I was the right-hand woman. I was always that extra pair of hands to lift, hold, or hand things to him, and I was also the gopher. During the remodel, we installed a high-efficiency fireplace designed to heat the whole house, so we heated with wood, although we did have a furnace for backup. My husband was constantly on the lookout for wooded areas being cleared. Everyone knew to call him if they needed help with trees that were down. Year-round, he'd throw the chainsaw in the truck, then him and the dog would bring home load after load of wood. He'd make sure we had four or five cords stacked, split, and ready for the winter. And he'd continue to replenish the supply whenever wood was available. My husband was retired. I was still working, so firewood was his domain. I never touched the chainsaw, but I did split and stack on weekends and sometimes after work. There was no reason to learn how to run the chainsaw. I had him, and he loved doing it. When we moved up north and bought a house with a mile-long driveway that we leased from the National Forest, my husband decided to teach our 13-year-old grandson, who happens to be 6'3 and 250 pounds, how to use a chainsaw. I was a bit worried at first, but he is a mature kid, and he was eager to learn. My husband had trained many carpenter apprentices and was keen on safety. So he bought him a pair of chaps, made sure he had good boots, ear protection, and eye protection. I decided that maybe it was time for me to learn too. My first problem was the dang pull start. My husband always held the saw in one hand, yanked the cord as he pushed the saw downward, and it started. My arms weren't long enough. I didn't have the same amount of strength, so my husband or my grandson started it for me as we were learning. I learned to cut up trees that were on the ground, how to prop them up so they didn't bind the saw, how to insert the saw up to the hilt and keep it pointed downward even when bringing it back out of the cut. I learned how to use the chainsaw. My husband's health was declining. He could no longer handle the chainsaw. I worried about emergency vehicles not being able to get up the driveway. But I really didn't like using the chainsaw. They're so hard to start. They're so big and too noisy. Most of what I needed to cut were small diameter spruces or pruning off enough branches to be able to drag them out of the way. So I bought a DeWalt battery-powered saw saw. It was perfect for pruning large branches or even small trees up to about four inches in diameter. I could make one or two cuts, drag the tree off the drive with a Jeep, or I could even use the come along. Even for trees that were larger or partially down, I could hook up a chain to the tractor and drag them down out of the way. I kept the driveway clear. 
The driveway is beautiful, like the famous tunnel of trees in northwest Michigan. It's a beach and maple hardwood forest scattered with birch, white spruce, and hemlock. It's a mile long. It winds and curves to stay on high ground. The area is not flat, but covered with little hilly areas and vernal ponds. The soil's loose and covered with a dense leaf pack. It's technically called a mesic northern forest, but one of the characteristics is a large amount of deadfall. I lease the driveway from the National Forest Service, and the lease stipulates that I cannot cut any trees more than 10 feet from the center of the road. This means I have to deal with things as they come down. No preventative maintenance is allowed. Just after my husband passed away, I could not keep the driveway open with just the saws off. The first time with tears streaming down my cheeks, I backed up the jeep half a mile, got the chainsaw, headed back down to the trees across the road, only to realize I'd forgotten the chaps, ear protection, eye protection, bar oil, and gas oil mix. So I backed up the driveway again to get the rest of the gear. Wearing enough clothes for two people, a heavy coat, boots, and chaps, I could barely bend over to start the saw. I don't think I've mentioned that I don't have cell service at the house. I do have satellite internet, but it's only when you're near the house. My nearest neighbor is a few miles away, if they're even home. There was no one I could call for help. Due to COVID, we never met anyone in the area other than the bank teller and grocery clerk in the town 20 minutes away. I could wait for the weekend and ask one of my sons to come help, or I could just get tough and get it done. My husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer 10 days before he died. He was home for the last five, but he was in so much pain, he spoke very little. We never had a chance to talk about him dying or how I'd handle things after he died. But the day before he died, I was dealing with some problem and he noticed my tears. And he said loud and clear, girl, you're going to have to get some balls. It was one of the last things I remember him ever saying to me. He was always my biggest cheerleader. He had more confidence in me than I ever did. 64 years old and I loved it when he called me girl. All summer, I only used a chainsaw when absolutely necessary. I deferred all but emergency tree removal on the driveway to my sons and grandsons when they came to visit. There were always a few trees that needed to be moved or cut up. During the summer, I cleared some trails with them, but I didn't use the chainsaw. I did the small stuff with the saw saw. But during the fall, there seemed to be trees across the driveway every few weeks, and I had to use the chainsaw to clear them. If it happened while I was away, it meant I'd have to walk a mile to the barn, get the equipment, convince the four-wheeler to start, drive back down the driveway with the equipment, clear the tree, take the four-wheeler and equipment back to the barn, then walk back down to the Jeep. I decided I needed to have a chainsaw and a tow strap in the Jeep to make sure that I could clear the trees and get back up the driveway to the house. We have three chainsaws. No, I have three chainsaws. It's so hard to think in terms of I, not we. I put my 12-inch chainsaw, gas oil mix, and bar oil in the Jeep. The weather was cold, and it was fine, but after a few days, the weather warmed up. The smell of gas and oil in the Jeep was nauseating. But coming home in the dark with a tree over the driveway and the thought of everything I'd need to do to get the chainsaw from the barn and take care of it on a cold winter's night, I decided it was a small price to pay. I needed to keep the chainsaw in the Jeep. Then I needed to go downstate in late November, a trip that would put me home at 9 or 10 at night. I realized that I might need the chainsaw to get back up the driveway, but I also knew I couldn't stand the smell of gas and oil for the eight-hour drive. So I took it out of the Jeep. I got lucky. One little spruce was hanging low over the drive when I came home, and I just drove right through it. A week later, the weather was terrible. I'd gone to Tawas to meet with a tax advisor, an issue for another widow podcast. I hadn't put the chainsaw back in the Jeep. It was cold, it was snowy, it was windy, and I was once again in tears. Then I thought, girl, you're just going to have to get some balls. 
Go buy a battery-powered chainsaw. I stopped in Oscoda. It took over an hour in the hardware, and it was a terribly difficult decision. My husband and I talked over everything, tossed around the pros and cons, checked prices before we bought things. I already had three chainsaws at home. Did I really need to buy another one? The salesman showed it to me. It wasn't any lighter than the 12-inch I had at home. I quizzed him as to what the diameter of the tree it could handle, how long would the battery remain charged when not being used, how long would it last when I was using it, how many cuts could it make on a charge, what maintenance would be required, how does it cut compared to my gas-powered chainsaws. The poor guy was not prepared for a worried widow making one of her first purchases without her husband. He was looking up things online, even calling Steele to get answers for me. And then I left without the saw. Walking back out to the Jeep, the weather had gotten worse. I'm good at making do with what I've got. I hate spending money if I don't have to. During our marriage, my husband would constantly tell me to go buy the damn thing when I hesitated to spend money on things I wanted or needed. I walked back in, handed them my credit card, and bought the saw. It lived in the Jeep until the week before Christmas. We got hit with a major windstorm. I could hear branches and entire trees snapping near the house. Looking down the driveway was impossible. Three trees were down near the garage. Snow and dropping temperatures were predicted. I needed to clear the driveway, especially since the power was out and I couldn't get the generator started. I had no way to communicate with anyone. Our lack of cell service around here is ridiculous. A friend of mine said that they had better service living in Alaska than they do in Northeast Michigan. I have to say, I love, I absolutely love my new battery-powered chainsaw. There were 12 trees down across the driveway. I would have had to pull start that old chainsaw over and over and over again. I put on my safety equipment no ear protection needed, I popped the battery in the chainsaw, threw it in the Jeep, and inched down the driveway. I had to cut the trees in smaller sections than my husband would have. He would have made one or two cuts and muscled the pieces out of the way. I had to be able to lift them, so I made a lot more cuts. It probably took me three times as long. I worked for four hours. I had to figure out where to make the cut so the chain wouldn't bind up and how to do it so things wouldn't land on me. I cut up 11 trees. The saw kept stopping while I was cutting the last one. I immediately got mad at myself for listening to the salesman, thinking the battery didn't last as long as he said it would. But I discovered it just needed more bar oil. Tree number 12 was near the end of the driveway. It was hung up in the trees. It was a widow maker. I laughed and laughed until I cried. There was no way I was going to try to take that widow maker down alone. I just didn't know how to tackle it safely. Since I was at the end of the drive, I had cell service and I called the neighbors for help. If you're a widow, get the tools you need. I'm so proud of myself for buying my chainsaw and my saw saw too. It was so hard to spend money on something I already had sitting in the barn, but it was the right decision for me. It's the right tool for me. Stay safe. There's a part of me as a widow missing my husband so much, living alone, facing so many challenges that I thought about taking down that widow maker myself, but he didn't. I knew I needed to stay safe and ask for help. Most of all, work on building up your confidence by having the courage to think things through and take action. Maybe you're a bit like me and you need to be told, girl, you're just going to have to get some balls. Coming up next, power outages. They've never really bothered me. It means slowing down and being unplugged for a while. But in the up north woods in winter, when the power is out for two days, three days, even four days, things can be a bit challenging for a widow in the up north woods. And coming up next, my chainsaw saga. It's a scary topic, but it's awfully hard to live up north without one, or two, or maybe even three. So it's just one more thing that you may want to learn. You've been listening to a locally up north podcast from a local citizen in our four-county community.
If you're interested and have a podcast idea, please contact us by sending us a personal message on Facebook, News Talk 98.9.